Hi, it's Ryan from Nights Around a Table. Nights Around a Table, the YouTube channel, the entertainment experience, the FDA non-approved dietary supplement. Nights Around a Table has hit a milestone as of a couple days ago. We've reached 5,000 subscribers. <laughs> Hopefully in post I'll add some exciting graphics. 5,000 subscribers, that's huge. A big thank you from me to you. And you say, well, 5,000 subscribers. So what, that's just people clicking like buttons and it doesn't translate to any sort of measure of success or hope for the future uh, for an unemployed creative person. Uh, in fact, it does. What's exciting about reaching 5,000 subscribers is that subscribers is the key metric when you're starting a YouTube channel. It's what gives people confidence that you know people are watching you and are excited about what you do. So what that translates into for a channel like mine is I'm able to go to publishers more often and request games that I'm interested in and they feel better banking on the shipping costs to send me copies that I can talk to you about. People who want to have videos made for their their Kickstarter campaigns, they come to people like me and hire us to make those videos and they're going to go for channels with higher subscriber counts than lower subscriber counts, generally speaking. So that subscriber count is a very important part of making this channel a success. If you're watching this as a subscriber, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. So for this video, I'm gonna do something a little bit differently than I've done before. One of my illustrious backers on Patreon, Homunculi Tsu, don't be alarmed, I think that's a pseudonym, uh, suggested a few things and eventually got to, hey, why don't you do a video about things that you love about board games? And I thought that was a fantastic idea. So this is gonna be five things I love about board games. Thank you, Homunculi Sue, for the suggestion. Now, Homunculi Sue is a Patreon backer. If you want to be like Homunculi Sue, and who doesn't? You can head over to Patreon right now and, and back me for as little as, I think, like a buck a month? You don't get perks at a buck a month, but some of the perks you can get at more than a buck a month are you can see my secret cache of documents, including my planning schedule to find out what I've got coming down the pipeline to put up on YouTube, and anybody at three bucks or above gets to see advanced screenings of my videos whenever I get them finished on time. So if you wanna see stuff up to an hour before it goes live, I don't know, maybe I've done as much as a week before it goes live, then you know, become a backer. If you are not able to become a backer financially, that's cool too because I have put together this entire section of the site that's all about how to support Nights Around a Table if you don't, or can't or don't want to give any money. There are all kinds of suggestions on there from clicking little buttons and making things go twirly do uh, that generally don't cost you any money. You can even buy things on Amazon that have nothing to do with this channel. And if you follow our Amazon link, then we'll get a little bit of a, a kickback. And I do mean a little bit of a kickback. I mean, I think I'm working up to 10 bucks after a year of doing it. So, <laughs> hey, every little bit counts, sort of. So, right. Five things I love about board games. Here we go. Number five, self-shuffling decks. I don't like shuffling cards because I'm very klutzy and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. This one is the riffle, I guess. I'm okay for the first two cards and then it just these two big wedges of cards just go blah and hit each other. And I'm, I'm always worried about bending my cards and wrecking them. I don't sleeve my cards and yet I'm still, and sleeving, oh, I don't like sleeving either because then when you when you shuffle the sharp corners, you sleevers don't seem to be concerned about poking your hands with sharp sleeve corners. Anyway, it's the reason why I don't play games like Dominion as much as I might because I, I just don't like the card shuffling. There was a game I played recently called North Wind that every single round there was this obnoxious shuffle of tiles or cards. Don't like it at all and that's why I, I went on a little uh, spirit quest trying to find another deck building game that didn't use cards. So that led me to Quarriers, and then from Quarriers, I went to Dice Forge, and from Dice Forge, I went to Orléans, which is a bag builder with discs, and I like Orléans. I think I'll, I think I'll stay 
with Orléans. But there are certain games that involve decks of cards and just the way that they've been designed to play, they shuffle themselves and I think that's fantastic. So Race for the Galaxy is a great example and one that I played just recently is called Oh My Goods and both of these games uh, you're using cards uh, face down as, as goods to put on production planets or production buildings and then when those goods get shipped off or cashed in for money they just go into a big discard pile and they just start piling up and it doesn't matter what's on the back of them and that's really great because as you discard them it, you know you just get a mix of cards so that when your draw deck runs out and your discard pile piles up and it's time to shuffle these and make a new draw deck you don't really have to do a lot of shuffling the game has shuffled itself how fantastic is that? Number four, going rogue. I try my very best in life to be a nice person, a, a decent fellow and, and kind to my, my, my fellow humankind. However, in board games, <laughs> I love it when there are mechanics that let you yeah, maybe do a little bit of shady dealing, maybe a little bit of little bit of backstabbing, a little bit of take that, a little bit of ah, pulling up the ladder kind of thing. That's why I like a game like Tricarian, which is about competing magicians, and you can you know you, you go down, and get yours, and pull the ladder up, and sort of hose the, your rival magicians. I like that kind of thing, just because that's not acceptable to do in real life, and I I wouldn't treat people that way in real life. But when it's a game and we're kind of play acting and we're kind of having fun, I, I, I'll admit, I mean, call me a bad person. And I have been called a bad person while I've been playing board games, but I like that kind of thing. I recently played a game called Caravan, which has as part of the game thief tokens. And you can use those tokens to steal goods from other people's camels. And two of the players, it was a four player game, two of the players got really mad that I was, I dared to use these thief tokens that are part of the game because thieving is not nice. Well, thieving is not nice in real life, but come on, people, when it's built into the game, that, that you know, all's fair in love and war, it's part of the game. And I like that. And I'm not gonna apologize for it. Sorry. Number three, bits that puzzle piece together. Now, I'm not talking about games like Carcassonne or maybe Keyflower, where you have tiles and you have to turn them so that the roads line up. That's fine, I guess, that's okay. No, what I'm talking about is games that have specific die cut pieces where the edges are irregularly shaped and they fit together. You can probably think of a bunch of examples. I guess one that comes to the top of my mind is Lords of Waterdeep where Everybody has a little badge that emblemizes, a little emblem of their faction, I suppose. And when you build buildings that are attributed to your faction, your little emblem, it's a, it's a, it's a little, you know, a special die cut piece. And then the, the negative is cut into the building and they fit together beautifully. And it's to the point where now, pay attention board game publishers, when I turn a box over and I see die cut bits that fit together, I think, nah, I need to get that game. I don't know why that's so compelling. And it, it's down to the point where there are certain games that they may not have such a high rating on Board Game Geek and people don't really talk about them and talk about how great they are, but because they have those puzzle PC elements to them, I feel compelled to buy those games and play them. A great example of that is this game called City of Gears, which seems to be no great shakes. Nobody's too thrilled about it. It's from 2012. But every single time I look at that game, it has these pieces, these these gear pieces, and the, the gear pieces slot into to gear cut boards. And I just, I don't know why I get twitchy about it. Now, a runner up to that, it's not quite as good as puzzle PC pieces, but a game that has recessed boards that you can stick stuff in is pretty compelling to me too. I vowed that I wouldn't buy Terraforming Mars because of the complaints about getting your cubes knocked around and the cat jumps on the table, there goes all your scoring and all your game progress. And I said, maybe I'll pick up Terraforming Mars uh, if and only if they have recessed boards. And look at that, just a recent Kickstarter, they, they announced recessed boards and so I, I'm in. Another example of that is Otis. It's a diving game, post-apocalyptic diving game that has recess boards that you slide pieces in and out. That's pretty cool. Not quite as cool as puzzle PC die cut things. Still pretty compelling. Number two, mitigating luck. If you're new to modern board games, you're going to make a discovery that I made a couple years ago, which is a bit... It's that a certain diehard contingency of modern board gaming 
hates luck. They hate luck in their games. And a number of the games that show up on Board Game Geek's top 100 list. Board Game Geek, if you don't know, is kind of like the internet movie database of board games. Boardgamegeek.com, you go there and, you know, people rank games and say what they like about them. And there's all kinds of stuff on that site. I couldn't, it would take multiple videos to cover what's on Board Game Geek. But on their top 100 list, you've got a number of games that are called perfect information games. Games like Terra Mystica, where aside from some of the scoring tiles that are dealt at the beginning of the game, there's no big dice roll every round or there's no weird card draw that, you know, th throws the game into an unexpected state. Every single time you play the game, just like chess, every single time you play the game, it's going to be exactly the same setup and exactly the same opening moves can be made by players. And then games that have a high degree of luck, Killer Bunnies is a, is a good example of, of a game that kind of overuses chance and luck. I think it was actually designed to teach probability. Somebody, somebody said that that I read. Everybody's saying it. That would be kind of like on the other end of the spectrum, just a game that uh, it's all about luck. I like something kind of in the middle. I find that life is random. There's a lot of luck that goes into life, so I don't mind that reflected in my games too much at all. I don't mind pulling cards from a random deck, but what makes a game better when it involves luck like that is when it includes a mechanic to mitigate the luck or to lessen the sting of a bad card draw or a bad die roll. So a great example is the Voyages of Marco Polo. You have camels as a currency and you can actually pay camels to adjust the, the roll of your dice up or down. Uh, a lot of games do this. In Castles of Burgundy, you have little worker tiles that you can purchase ahead of time, sort of as an insurance sort of thing, and then you can use them to change the faces of your dice up and down in order to, you know, mitigate a bad roll or, or to sort of steer you towards getting what you really need or really want. That's great. So I think if your game is going to include luck, that's fine. And if it includes mechanics that mitigate the luck, uh, even better. The number one thing that I love about board games is when they light up my brain like a Christmas tree. So it may surprise you for me to confess to you that I consider myself sort of a smart person. I have more going on up here than I have going on, you know, down here. So I'll compare myself to somebody who, you know, exercises all the time or is maybe an athlete, right? When an athlete doesn't exercise after a while, they find their muscles tensing up and they need to, they need to stretch and they get kind of ermy and they really want to go work their body out. And it's the same kind of thing with my brain. I find that I need constant stimulation all the time, and it's really hard to find that in everyday life. Everyday life I don't find is all that interesting or stimulating. A lot of it is rote and routine and deadly boring and dull. And when my brain gets bored, it's almost like it's painful. You know, like when a person who exercises a lot doesn't exercise the muscles, it gets kind of achy. My brain gets kind of achy. So I find that board games, playing board games, is one pastime that exercises my brain in a delightful way that feels really good. It's just like, uh, it's just like stretching it. It's like pumping iron in my occipital lobe. I don't know which one's my occipital lobe because I'm really not that smart. That's why I tend to go for games that are really puzzly and thinky, and we call them brain burners, the more complex than simpler games. And I think I annoy a bunch of my friends trying to get them to play these games with me because they don't really enjoy that sort of mental workout. They want more of a leisurely time hanging out if they're gonna play a board game at all. I'm not like that. So I'm kind of like, I guess, somebody who runs marathons, right? It's, <laughs> you can't get all your friends running marathons with you because that's just not everybody's bag. It's my bag, and in fact, it's something that I crave and I need all the time. Complex board games. It's a great way to prevent your brain from turning into mush. Hopefully, I haven't turned your brain to mush in this pr prattly, chatty video. Thank you again if you're a subscriber for clicking that button. If you haven't yet, uh, please consider clicking that button because now we've got a new target. That's 10,000 subscribers. We're, this train's rolling. It was so funny last year because, it was so funny, so ouchy last year because we were desperately trying to get to 1,000. That's the trigger for YouTube to actually uh, share some of the ad revenue that they make on, on your video with you as a creator. You gotta hit 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of watched video. You're like, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to reach 4,000 hours in a 365 day period of watched video? Well, 
<laughs> Look at us now, 5,000 subscribers and probably about 15,000 hours of watched video. And that's all thanks to you. Thank you so much again for subscribing and we'll see you in the next one. What are some things you love about board games? Let me know in the comments. I was supposed to ask during the video, but I forgot. Did you just watch that whole thing? Oh, hey, to 100% this video, click the badge to subscribe and then click the bell to get notifications when I've got new stuff.